to the, the pixels all the way through the bureaucratic process and through the legal process and then back down again in order to make sure that things are actually changing on the ground. So we are a law uh, focused organization um, that's based on field work and lobbying and what we try to do is to affect policy. We try to get, collect the information and go through the steps that will get the government of Israel to do its job, um, and when necessary, we are uh, we work with the government in order to change legislation, to create legislation or change policy so that the problems are addressed in a comprehensive manner. So uh, I'll just add in as an aside, I open the chat on the side. So if you guys have questions, you can put them there and then I'll try to get to them as we scroll through. So, um, her, hold on a minute having a technical moment, right? So um, this is essentially, in a nutshell, what we do. We do field work, we do research, um, and we carry that through the bureaucratic and legal process. And we try to encourage and empower the state rather than um, attacking the state, which we don't generally do, even though very often we find ourselves going to court and suing the state of Israel or its various ministries, its various arms. Um, in order to encourage them to actually enforce the law. So we protect Israel's most important resource, first and foremost, and that's the land itself, uh, but other resources as well. We deal with environmental issues, with uh, water, air pollution, um, distribution of resources that are um, essentially make up the land of Israel. So this is how we do it. Uh, what you see here, well, who you see here are the people who I work with, more or less, almost all of them uh, on a daily basis. We go out in the field and we examine who's doing what, who has the right to do what. Uh, if they don't have the right to do whatever it is they're doing, who does? Who's, who's responsible? Who owns the land? Who's supposed to be taking care of it? Um, and if necessary, we, we submit official complaints to the various municipal or regional or military uh, authorities that are responsible for the area. If that doesn't work, we take it one notch higher and we go to court and we will sue if there's a failure of the government or any of its arms to enforce the law. Now, very often I'm asked, do you do this uh, only against Arab construction, only against Arab illegal activity, or do you do it against Jewish illegal activity? So I'll just tell you that Rigovim was created as a response to this exact same type of monitoring that was being focused only on Jewish settlement activity by leftist organizations such as Peace Now uh, and others. Um, they have that angle very, very well handled. So we don't generally have a problem, although often in cases of environmental abuse where no one else is prosecuting, we do prosecute Jewish uh, lawbreakers, offenders, people who are causing pollution or doing things that they shouldn't be doing with state land, with public property. So, but in general, yes, for uh, reasons that are unfortunately very, very clear, no one else is doing this. No one else is enforcing the law against illegal, massive illegal construction that is going on um, on the part of the Palestinian Authority itself and individual Arabs in Judea and Samaria. So we go out in the field, we inspect, we monitor, we document, we take pictures, we take aerial pictures, we use drones. Um, we compare that to uh, previous aerial photos in state archives. We go to the state archives and look up land deeds. We check government maps. We see who owns what and what's happening and how it's happening, when it, when it happened, and how that process is going forward. So I'm gonna give you a very brief history lesson, which I hope will explain what the term illegal construction really refers to. Because illegal construction, what makes something illegal? If I add a, uh, if I add a, a balcony to my house or an, add a room onto my house without a permit, that's illegal. But we're talking about a very large and complex system of law that comes together in strange ways and it developed over um, let's say almost a hundred years 
So I wanna take a very, very brief look at all of this. If it's repetitive for some of you, I apologize. But without the background, we don't really get a good grasp of what makes something illegal. So we wanna take a very quick look at that. So what we have here is a map of the original mandate for Palestine, right? The mandate covered both the orange and yellow area. The entire area was set aside by the nations of the world for the Jewish homeland. Uh, at a certain point, in contravention of international law, the British set aside almost 80% of the territory and created the state of Jordan. This was actually illegal because all of the mandatory powers at the, in the aftermath of the First World War were given um, custodianship over areas that would eventually become independent. Uh, the contract that they had essentially was that they were not allowed to make any changes. They were supposed to keep the status quo on the ground until such time as independent governments could be formed and the people in question could take over for themselves. And unfortunately, the British decided, more or less understandably at a, to a certain degree, uh, that the bloodshed that was going on because of Arab rioting and massacres and all kinds of bloodshed that was happening, that they would try to appease the Arab population by creating another Arab state. This is your first two-state solution, if you would. 1922, the Cairo Conference. Um, well, we're now actually celebrating, I don't know how many of you are aware of it, but right now we're, we're celebrating 100 years of the San Remo Conference where this first, this mandate was set aside uh, and then a very, very short time later, the British essentially, um, let's say, violated the terms of their mandatory power and created the state of Jordan. Time went on. This was the original map that created the state of Jordan. As you can see, the majority of the territory was ceded, and this was what the international lines looked like. In 1947, because the bloodshed continued, uh, a second two-state solution was suggested. It was called the Partition Plan. And although it was extremely disadvantageous to the Jewish population of Israel at the time, the Yishuv, the, the Jewish community of, uh, of Palestine, essentially accepted it anyway, but the Arabs rejected it. Notice that the two colors, you'll see that, again, um, they tried to create lines that would more or less cut the country up where Jewish population and Arab population wouldn't have to be intermingled. Um, again, the Arabs rejected this. As we go along, this is the, the map that was created in 1948. I, I'm going to go back one. I just want to point out that uh, this map, the map that was meant to be the basis for the two-state solution, Jordan and Israel. Notice that everything to the west of the Jordan River, uh, can you see my pointer, this, this line here? Everything on the west side belonged to the state, of the proposed state of Israel. Everything on the right was Jordan. That means the west bank of the Jordan was always meant to be part of Israel, here again. The, when they originally created Jordan and Palestine, the west side of the Jordan River, the West Bank, was always intended to be part of Palestine. We'll go back again. Oh, I don't have an earlier map with me, sorry. Okay, so here you have it. In 1948, at the end of the War of Independence, the Jordanians managed to occupy things to the west of the Jordan River. They created a new name for this area in order to justify their occupation and annexation of it. They called it the West Bank of the Jordan, even though it never was called that. It had always, in international documents and in historic documents, and for going back thousands of years, never had a separate name. It was never referred to as the West Bank. It was always referred to as Judea and Samaria. The Jordanians didn't like those names for obvious reasons and created a new nomenclature, they started calling it the West Bank of the Jordan. They annexed and occupied this territory. They occupied and annexed this territory. Um, and their annexation of this territory, which was illegal and was done as a result of 
an, aggression, an act of aggression, a war which they initiated, was not recognized by any of the countries of the world except for two. Anybody know who those two are? <laughs> those two are Great Britain and Iraq. All the other countries of the world, including the Arab League, including all the other Arab countries, rejected and condemned the Jordanian occupation of this territory. But that was the situation that remained on the ground for 19 years. Then, in 1967, the map changed again, and Israel retook what had originally been slated to be part of the state of Israel. And here it is, the West Bank. Now, for reasons that you've probably heard of, uh, which we're not going to go into now, Israel left that situation uh, dangling, did not annex that, that territory. Um, it was clearly uh, not taken in an act of aggression, not in a war, but in, uh, as in an act of self-defense because Israel was attacked. Uh, and by all rights, by historical rights, uh, and in any other case, every other case in world history, territory that is reclaimed in an act of self-defense has never ever been returned to the aggressors. But Israel, once again, is very, very different. So you'll notice the West Bank here, and you'll notice the Gaza Strip here. You'll notice the Golan Heights here. Those are all areas that need discussing in terms of uh, Israeli sovereignty, et cetera, et cetera, but that's not our topic today. I just, what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to get across here is the maps and the changes of the maps. Keep this picture in mind because this is the picture that stayed in force for years until this map was created. This is the map that was created by the Oslo Accords. And it's the exact same area, Judea and Samaria, i.e. the West Bank. Sorry, I'm gonna go back one. See, it's a, a close-up of this area. The Oslo Accords divided up that same area into three distinct sec sections. Area A in the bright red and Area B, both under Palestinian Authority control. The Oslo Accords, by the way, created the Palestinian Authority, which hadn't existed beforehand, as a precursor or as the official representative of the Palestinians, the Arabs living in this area. And Area C, which is all of the yellow, everything else. So it divides up more or less 60-40. This is about 60% of the overall area in question. This is about 40%. So Area A is under full Arab control. Area B is under Arab civilian control with Israel having peripheral security authority. And Area C is under full Israeli jurisdiction, both for civilian matters and for security matters. Okay, so it's easy to remember that if you wanna try to keep a mnemonic in your head. A stands for either Arab or Arafat. B stands for Beyachad, which means together. And C stands for Selanu, which it doesn't really, but that means that's our, that's our area. What we'd like to talk about today is who is in charge, really, what the Oslo Accords say, what international law says, and what this means on the ground, okay? So this is the, the map, really, that should be in force up till today. The Oslo Accords were ratified, uh, by the State of Israel, they were accepted. They are international law for all intents and purposes because no other agreement has superseded them ever since. So this is what the map should look like. But here's where the problems really start. This isn't what the map looks like. Now the map looks like this. What you see here are these purple dots. And what these purple dots are, you'll notice that they're concentrated around Jerusalem, kind of in a like that, and in a pattern that goes the length and all the way, the, the length of the entire territory. So what are those purple dots? Those purple dots are illegal settlements. They are illegal settlements created by the Palestinian Authority with the funding provided by the European Union almost exclusively, and they are there not by accident. That is 
all of this, all of these purple dots is what we want to talk about today. Now I'm just going to flip through to a map that we're going to come back to later, but I want to show you, no, wrong way, sorry. I want to show you a geographical map uh, of what we're looking at, just to give you a sense of the entire territory. This is- I love your, your map collection, it's fantastic. <laughs> this is what we do. At Rigavim, we go out in the field and we collect information and then we create maps. So that's why this whole talk is based on maps. Not only do we create maps, our information is the basis for pretty much everyone else's map, like the Kohala Policy Forum, We've presented our maps both to the Israeli government and to the United States government, and we'll get back to that later, and to the European uh, Union, uh, et cetera, et cetera. This is our expertise, um, and this is really why I think we, we need to just, if we, if we talk about the maps, it's not a subjective issue. They're, this is irrefutable fact, right? So this map is the same territory and it's marked out the things that we're going to speak about today. Just to give you an overall view of the whole thing, the total area of Judea and Samaria is around 6 million dunams, just, low, just a little bit less than 6 million dunams, which is 6,000 square kilometers, somewhere around 2,250 square, square miles, right? So, but we talk in dunams, that's, uh, that's the way you measure territory in this part of the world. Okay, areas A and B are around 2.26 million, uh, million dunams, and the remainder, around 3.5 million dunams, is under Israeli jurisdiction. In this map, you'll see all this gray area, that's Israeli. The pink area is under Arab control. And all the red dots here, all the red dots are is illegal Palestinian construction in areas under Israeli control. The green dots, shockingly enough, are Israeli communities in, is in Judea and Samaria. The entire collection of is Jewish construction in Judea and Samaria, I'm talking about legal, illegal, um, recognized, unrecognized, however you want to call it, all of, in all of Judea and Samaria, Jewish construction covers, and agriculture, covers less than 1% of the territory. So all the noise that I, you hear- Naomi, is it possible to share this map with us? Because I think this I will is, share the entire thing with you. I'll give you the whole you. presentation. You. This is, guys, I want you to just focus in on that. Look at the green dots on the map. Look how little of the actual land area of Judea and Samaria the Jewish communities take up. Right. That's, that's a representation that you could share with anybody. Okay, I can give you the exact uh, numbers of structures and everything else. We'll go back into the, and I'll, we're going to build up to this, but this is just an overview, right? So there, what, when we began tracking what was going on over 10 years ago, we began looking at instances of illegal construction by Arabs. Now, illegal construction by Jews, what happens? So somebody will, the, the, the structure of the legal system here makes it extremely simple for anyone in the world to get involved in this issue, which they do. Uh, organizations fund lawfare against the state of Israel and immediately when something goes up, and that can literally be um, somebody paving their garden in their backyard in a settlement that is recognized by the state of Israel, but they don't have the proper permits, it will be torn down, generally within a couple of weeks. But the Palestinians have been building systematically for over a decade, um, and the state of Israel has done nothing about it, absolutely nothing. And we're going to talk about why. So I'm gonna go slide back quickly to where we were up to on our thing here, and I'm gonna show you some things that will knock your socks off. So, as I said, this is what the map started to look like. And we began to try to understand why. We created this map by going out in the field, taking pictures, plotting out on a geographical map, every single point of settlement that we found, finding out as much about it as we could, 
investigating who was in charge of every particular area, if there was any private ownership involved, if it was all on state land, what was on there that was creating these settlements and how they came to be. And we have been tracking this phenomenon for, again, over a decade. What we began to notice was a pattern, not only a pattern of where these places are, but also of who's living in them and how they came to, into existence. The first thing that we noticed is their strategic locations, because we began to notice that they formed a very, very clear pattern of settlement that was creating a spine along this whole area, the spine of the Palestinian state. Now, all of this construction activity is aimed at, you know what's on the other side of this line here, right, is Jordan. 80% of the people living over this line here consider themselves Palestinian. They self-identify as Palestinian. That is what they are and that is what they were always meant to be because when Jordan was created, it was created in order to um, create a state for the Arabs living in Palestine. So these people and these people are in the same families, the same tribes. So I'm sorry, I see that somebody raised a hand. I just don't know exactly how to get to that, but I'm gonna try to collect up a whole bunch of questions in two minutes. I just wanna get to, through this series of maps. Maybe- Yeah, sure, when, when you're ready for a question, we can call on Maya. Okay, so we began to notice the pattern of the locations of these places, and we began to notice how they were created. So we took hundreds of pictures like these. What we noticed was that in places where there was no settlement, there was nothing there before, there were no, it wasn't like this was some historic village or anything like that, the European Union sent people, sent materials, sent equipment and prefabricated structures that are identical were popping up all over the countryside in this very, very clear pattern. And we documented hundreds, thousands even, of these things. You can see the European Union symbol on the sides of the buildings, very proudly displayed. Now that's just not, not just because they take pride in their work, it's because they are claiming diplomatic immunity for these structures, which is why the State of Israel was extremely hesitant to knock them down, even though they are illegal. Now, what makes them illegal? What makes them illegal is three things. Number one, the Oslo Accords placed all of these areas under full Israeli jurisdiction. And that means that nothing should happen in these areas without Israeli approval no construction by Jews or Arabs, right? That's number one. But let's say, as some people would like to, that the Oslo Accords are already null and void because both sides have violated them or whatever. That's not how you void an international treaty, but let's just ignore the Oslo Accords for a minute. And let's say that Israel is an occupier of this territory, as a lot of people would like to say. Under the internationally recognized law, which is the Geneva Conventions, the occupier in any territory has the sole right and responsibility to issue permits for any construction that happens in that territory. That means that even if there weren't a very clear framework set up in Oslo for who should be in charge and what should be happening on the ground, international law automatically would say that, under, that, that only the state of Israel as an occupier would be permitted to give building permits and nothing without those permits should be allowed to happen, the State of Israel would be fully within its rights to knock anything down that was built without permits. So whichever way you cut it, either under the Oslo Accords or under international law, the Geneva Conventions, none of this is legal. But it carries on and on and on hundreds of these structures thousands of them. Now, how did these places come to be and where, where are they? As I said, they're strategically, they're, they're in strategic points. The, the Palestinian Authority, 10 years ago, published a plan, in two, it's actually 11 years ago now, in 2009, the Prime Minister of the Palestinian Authority, 
a man named Salam Fayyad, uh, unveiled his plan. Now, 2009 was only a few years after Israel had ceded every last centimeter that it had, been, uh, that it had committed to give back uh, in order to create peace. And four, about four years after the whole thing, the Palestinian Authority's prime minister said, you know what, this uh, negotiated and uh, dialogue and whatever, this isn't working for us. We're going to create facts on the ground and create a Palestinian state de facto. And how are we going to do that? We're going to have our frontline soldiers in the creation of the Palestinian state are going to be the Bedouin. Now, the Bedouin are the most vulnerable and most easel, easily manipulated population here because they are nomads and they have no representation. They are stateless, more or less. So we will put them where we want them to be. And they did this very, very simply. They deposited water tankers at strategic spots and went away. The only thing a Bedouin family needs is water. Everything else, they're self-sufficient. That's why the Bedouin move from place to place with the seasons because they're seeking water sources. Is, so is everyone familiar with what Bedouin are? The Bedouin are, are uh, Arabs that engage in traditional Arab tribal culture, and they are a somewhat nomadic people, and they live across borders. So they live in Israel and Egypt and in Jordan, and they travel from country to country, often irrespective of borders. Um, and so in some of these cases, they are settling. So I just want to keep you guys paying attention to what they have very good. So actually, um, it's an interesting thing about the Bedouin because in Israel, as in every other place in the Middle East, Bedouin uh, over the past hundred years have been undergoing a, um, a process that they call it urbanization, which means that there are really very, very few truly nomadic populations left. They're all at the most semi-nomadic. So what the Palestinian Authority did was they placed water tankers in spots where they wanted the Bedouin to congregate. And the Bedouin found that they were being given free water and they stayed precisely where the water tankers were. The next thing the Palestinian Authority did was they built schools in all of these spots. They built schools because A, it attracts more population and B, it makes terrible, terrible photo opportunities when the state of Israel actually gets around to demolishing a structure that they then claim that the state of Israel is denying the most vulnerable children in education. So, I'm gonna show you now the development of one of these things, a classic case. This is a place you may have heard about in the news. Rigavim has been involved in this case for over 10 years. We were supposed to have another round of Supreme Court hearings this week, Wednesday, and we were just notified that it was pushed off indefinitely. So here it is. Just outside Jerusalem, uh, towards the Judean desert, there's a, uh, an area called the Adumim region. The Adumim region, where if you've ever heard of Male Adumim or Mishor Adumim, that's what we're looking at here. It's the very, very edge of the desert leading up to Jerusalem. Okay, there's a community there um, called Kfar Adumim. What you see here is an aerial photo from the State Archives from 1999. This is what it looked like in 1999. The beginnings of a major road here or the remnants of a road, let's say. A couple of tents, here's something pretty much empty, right? There were always in this area Bedouin tribes that would come through in the seasons and then they would move on. This is what the area looked like in 2008, right? The state of Israel had widened the road to a two lane highway and it was still pretty much empty. There was a tent here. There were a couple of structures here, probably just to sh shelter uh, herds during the herding season and then were abandoned. Not much going on. Remember, again, in 2009, Salam Fayyad presented his plan for the creation of a de facto Palestinian state. Look at the date here, 2008. Everything's kind of pretty much quiet. Then we have 2013. And you see all kinds of activities starting up here. Um, what happened is the water tanker story and the school story. And an, a, an Italian NGO spent some money and created a school right here. Now this land 
was slated, this part over here was slated for the expansion of the road. This road is called Route 1. Now, I don't know where you're from, but everywhere I've ever lived, when you call something Route 1, it means it's a pretty important highway. And this one is, because it services the capital of the state of Israel. It goes to Jerusalem, and it goes from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv, and it pretty much goes from the Dead Sea all the way across the country. It's Route 1, and it's an important highway, which is why the Palestinian Authority focused on this area and has built a whole lot of things, which we're going to see now in the next slides. So going back here a second, we got involved because this side of the area is land that belongs to the community just over here, which you can't see, called Kfar Adumim. And they realized all of a sudden that they had a problem because a permanent structure had come up on land that was slated for the expansion and development of their community. So they turned to us as experts in land research and rights, and we researched the area, we collected all the data, and we realized this was state land, and that an international organization had been funding illegal construction here. We went to court. In areas like this, we have found that over 80% of the structures on the ground, if you look at them, they all look identical. Almost 80% of the structures in these quote unquote settlements are provided by the European Union, which means that if the European Union had never gotten itself involved, these places wouldn't exist. They created them. They've created this problem and then they cry and scream and, and prosecute Israel that we've created a humanitarian crisis because these communities are living in such dire conditions. Well, of course, they've created communities in areas that are not viable. This is what it looks like. Notice the signs. They create these far-flung, impossible to live in communities in the middle of deserts, and they put their signs up. We have the United Kingdom, the European Union. We have Abu Dhabi involved here. We have Belgium, we have France, we have Sweden, we have Ireland, all of the wonderful friends of Israel uh, in the European community and beyond who have created these humanitarian nightmares and are using the Bedouin as pawns to control areas in crucially strategic points throughout Judea and Samaria. And the state of Israel has been afraid to do anything about it. Here's a closer look at one of those signs. See if you recognize any of those uh, charming things. This one is, this one is the uh, Abu Dhabi, Palestinian Authority, European Union, UK, right? And so Naomi, everybody's in on the act. Us a, you showed us a picture earlier of the houses actually having the EU flag on yeah. them. Is that sure. real or, or were they just labeled for the picture? No, no, no. They, they, are all, they all have them. Those are real pictures from, from out in the field. I can show you hundreds of them. So if this construction is illegal and mm -hmm. the Israeli courts determine it to be illegal and the buildings are marked with EU logos and flags, Mm -hmm. Couldn't Israel file a lawsuit directly against the EU or those aid or NGOs for, for building illegally on Israeli public land? They should, but they have no one to blame but themselves if they don't enforce their own laws. The okay, law says okay. they should be torn down, and they're not enforcing the law. So this is just a quick look at that same map we saw before with the purple dots. We overlaid on top of it a map of green dots. The green dots are all settlements, quote unquote, in which 80% or more of the structures are carrying the EU symbol. Just to give you an idea. Now, you'll notice, whoops, sorry. You'll notice the concentration. It's more or less a stranglehold around Jerusalem. Now, I have a question for all of you. See all this? How come there's no purple dots here, here, here? Here, here, all over here, all down here, all up here. The same Bedouin live in all of these places. The same Bedouin live in Jordan. The same ones live in the north. They live in areas A and B. They live in air, they're all over. How come the European Union only funds these and doesn't give one penny to any of these Bedouin or these Bedouin or these Bedouin? The answer is really simple because this is political construction. It's all masked as humanitarian aid. That is how all this money comes through. The European Union calls it humanitarian aid, but it is clearly political. It has a political pattern. It has a political purpose. 
and it was all laid out in a political vision for the creation of a de facto Palestinian state in complete rejection of the Oslo process by the Prime Minister of the Palestinian Authority in 2009. So this is the place that we were looking at before. It's what it looks like today. And this is called Khan al Ahmar. Khan al Ahmar, as you notice, this is the highway, right? The highway that we looked at. These people are living literally on the highway. Under these trees here is the school that was built by the Italian NGO 10 years ago. The Italian NGO is called Vento de Terra. It's an uh, Italian church group, quote unquote, humanitarian uh, church aid. And the community of Kfaradumim is up here, but you can't really see it here, right? You'll also notice here, there's another whole settlement. And across the road over here, there's another one. And there's, we counted 73 of these area, of these quote unquote settlements. They're all given a name, they're all given some sort of, they, they make up a whole heritage for them. But as you can see, as long ago as 2008, there was nothing there, right? So we went to court, we petitioned the court, and we said, look, these people are living without sewage, without running water, without electricity. The only, um, the only reason they're there is because the Europeans have put them there. This is not in their best interests. Uh, and it is also not in the best interests of the state of Israel to have a Palestinian Authority run settlement on the main highway from which, from the school, by the way, they throw rocks down on the road with uh, frequency. This is not a good thing, not a good thing for anyone. The state of Israel needs to behave like a real sovereign state and enforce the law and remove this place. So 10 years ago already, we won our first Supreme Court decision and the state said, absolutely, this is illegal. There's no way to claim that it is legal. These people should not be here, but because no one else is taking care of them, even though they're not Israeli citizens, they are the responsibility of the Palestinian Authority, the state of Israel, it behooves the state of Israel to find them an alternative, to create an alternative living situation for them, which is what the state did. They, they created a whole new neighborhood just outside Abu Dis, an Arab speaking uh, Palestinian Authority controlled neighborhood of Jerusalem. It's about four miles away from the site where we were just looking at. They created this entire neighborhood. They ran paved roads, electricity, sewage, running water, school, health clinic, access to employment, access to the city, normal living conditions. And they said, okay, time to move. And then the Palestinian Authority and the European Union went to court to block their move to this area. They forced them to stay there. They actually arrested members of the the, the heads of this family who are living here, the heads of this tribe. They brought them into Ramallah, they held them, and they threatened them with physical harm and said, if you make any deal with the Israelis or move one inch from this spot, we will burn your houses down. Uh, so they're still there. We went to court again. We went to court a third time. Six rounds of, Is of Israeli Supreme Court hearings so far, and six times the state has said, there is no justification for leaving these people where they are. This is not in their best interest. This is not the way a state runs. This is illegal construction and it has to be torn down. And six times, it's still standing there and it's there today. And unfortunately, I assume that when you come to Israel, if it's soon, it'll still be there. We're looking at this over and over and over again. As I said, we, we found dozens and dozens of these settlements. They all have the same sort of story, the same development, and the state of Israel has done nothing about them. Eventually, when things became so ridiculous about three, four years ago, we finally, after badgering the government, convinced Prime Minister Netanyahu to confront the European Union. And he did. And he got a commitment from Federica Mogherini, the foreign minister, essentially, of the European Union, that they would desist from any future, any further, any additional illegal construction in this area. And we thought that was a great thing. We thought that was a great victory. We thought that we had finally made a huge dent and that we would be protecting any further loss of Israel's strategic land assets. But we didn't take into consideration the new tactic that they would employ instead. And that's what this is. 
Rather than investing money in building new settlements, new building new buildings, the European Union started investing all their money in agricultural projects. And what you see here is our map. This is already almost two years old, over two years old. It's our map of illegal European funded agricultural land grabs. So how does that work? The law in force in Judea and Samaria, because Israeli law was never extended there, is Ottoman land law. And according to Ottoman land law, which by the way is so outdated that even the Ottoman Empire abandoned it 100 years ago. Ottoman land law, by the way, says that women aren't allowed to own property and all kinds of other really progressive stuff like that. But Ottoman land law states that if you use a piece of land for agricultural purposes, and it doesn't matter how you got it, if you stole it, if you borrowed it, whatever, if you, you can prove that you've been using it and it hasn't, your use of it hasn't been contested for a certain amount of time, you can claim rights to it. Taking advantage of this lacune, this absolute monstrosity loophole in Ottoman land law, the Palestinian Authority has been paying and the European Union has been funding massive agricultural land seizure projects in the same strategic areas all around Jerusalem and in between all of the Jewish settlement blocks in order to break up the Jewish uh, communities, break them off from one another and isolate them from Israel proper. So you would say, so why don't the Jews do the exact same thing? Well, here's, a crazy, here's the crazy part. The Supreme Court of the State of Israel handed down a decision several years ago that Ottoman land laws loophole could only be used for Arabs, not for Jews. So if a Jew goes out and plants trees in his backyard or in a piece of land that belongs to the state of Israel just outside the, the, his neighborhood, it will be uprooted immediately. He will be fined and possibly sent to jail for grabbing land that doesn't belong to him. But if Arabs do the exact same thing, the state of Israel is more or less has deemed itself more or less powerless to do anything about it. And the, and the Palestinian Authority has already overtaken thousands of dunams of land in this manner. Since we tried to limit the illegal construction, they just switched tactics, but they did not abandon the battle. So there's a quick overview, the one we saw before. And you can see that we, tracked illegal construction, which has doubled over the past 10 years since the Fayyad plan was announced. And this is what the map now looks like, the map of Judea and Samaria. I'm gonna to try to sum up with this and take some of your questions. Um, so we'll just have a look at what it looks like now. So before we look at the map in, in depth, I'm gonna raise some of the questions that are always raised and answer them as we look at the map. The first question is, well, you know, what do you expect? Arabs, the state of Israel doesn't give Arabs permits to build in Judea and Samaria. So of course they have to build illegally and they have no choice because they have nowhere else to go. They can't, they have to live somewhere and it's a growing population. So what did we do? We went out into the field and we took all the maps and we took aerial photos and satellite photos and GIS photos and Palestinian Authority maps and Israeli maps. And we said, okay, let's check, is this really true? How much of areas A and B, which are under full Palestinian Authority control for which they don't need us to give them permission to build, how much of it have they actually utilized? And where they have built illegally, why have they built there? And so this is the map. So again, we're looking here at the area covered by Israeli versus Arab construction in Judea and Samaria. The area covered by Arab construction in areas A and B is only around 80%. That means that they have 20% of their land reserves completely. You see these, this area? This is open spaces under their control that they haven't used, right? They have a lot of place to go. They don't need our permission to build there. They have nothing to do with us, and they have a lot of empty space. Now, the, the area of Arab construction in area C, the orange stuff, these tiny little, all of this, you see them? I don't know how big.
big your resolution is, you can make your screen bigger. But all of it is clearly, uh, it, it forms a clear pattern, again, in the same typical places surrounding Jerusalem and, whoops, sorry. And I'm going the wrong way. Yeah, right? Now, this is the, the interesting statistic down here, is how much space they really have and how little they need us in order to meet the needs of their population. They're not taking advantage of their available land, they're not taking advantage of their uh, existing authority, and they're building politically. It's, it's extremely clear that they're building projects are completely politically motivated. This is what emerges when we check the facts on the ground, and that's what we do. So let me see if I can take some of your questions. I think Maya had the first question. Okay. Um, I had a question. Just a second, I took notes. Um, so, uh, well, you kind of answered my first question, which was about the purple dots, because um, I can read a little in Hebrew, and I saw that it was labeled as Bedouin for the purple ones. Mm -hmm. So um, I wanted to ask why it was labeled as Bedouin and not as like Palestinian establishments. These, the whole point of the Fayyad plan, I'm going to go back to that map, mm -hmm. sorry, I hope I'm not making you all dizzy. The whole point of the Fayyad plan was that rather than trying to move their own populations into areas they wanted to control, they mm -hmm. simply moved people who were easy to move, and that's Bedouin. And they were extremely easy to move. Now, this whole area, a lot of it is desert. I don't know if, how much you recognize here, but this is Jericho, right? Dead Sea. This is all extremely desert area. The only people who actually live here, more or less, were Bedouin who traveled through on their routes from Jordan and across, and they went looking for water sources. So the Palestinian Authority provided free water sources and kept them where, what, where they wanted them. So they are Bedouin. They are all in, inhabited completely by Bedouin. There are no non-Bedouin residents of any of these places. Um, and I had a second question. So. Um, you said that like um, all of it is funded by the EU, mm -hmm. or most of it, mm -hmm. and uh, when they built a, s a separate place for the Bedouin to live in with um, sewage, with running water and all of that, uh, that they were being, like they endangered, the Palestinians endangered the leaders of like the households, right? The, the, let me correct you. The Palestinians did no such thing. They did not create those new places for the no, Bedouin. No, not the Palestinians. Like when Israel, Israel created did. those new, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But like the, the Palestinians then said like, if you go, we're gonna harm you. Mm -hmm. So why didn't the EU get involved or like the people that funded these places get involved with it? Like to, mm -hmm. to cause it is a much better built place it's it's got everything for a more comfortable life for the bedouins so mm -hmm. why wouldn't you get like the people who actually fund these places mm -hmm. to be involved in it so that they can like help you well not exactly protect them but get them safely from one spot to another mm -hmm. it's a very good question um the 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 fact is they did get involved they got involved on the wrong side they have, they have been going to uh, this, the court to stop the relocation of these people. They won't allow them to move. They are not really concerned with the welfare of the people who are living there. This is political construction. This is political 100%. Because if it were about actual humanitarian issues, as we said, first of all, they would encourage them to move into normal, modern places that have been prepared for them by the State of Israel. And also, they would be helping Bedouin from the same tribes who are living in the same or even worse conditions inside areas A and B under Palestinian control, inside Jordan, inside Lebanon, inside Syria, in the Sinai, but they don't. 
they're not really concerned about humanitarian conditions for these people or for their future. They are concerned about politics. They have stated, and I can send you the documents, over and over again, publicly, European Union announcements that their aim is to promote Palestinian statehood. And they are doing that unilaterally. On the one hand, they constantly say that they want a negotiated resolution to the conflict. On the other hand, they are completely funding unil illegal, illegal unilateral activity and undermining the Oslo Accords. So they're playing both sides against the middle and the state of Israel has been extremely hesitant to do anything about it because they don't want to take on the entire European Union. We actually, I myself and two other members of the Regovian team, went to the European Parliament this past year to present these things directly to members of the European Parliament who are on key committees. They had no idea where their money was going. They know how much money they're spending on humanitarian aid, on what they call support for indigenous farmers, on creating new water sources, et cetera, et cetera. What they didn't realize is those are code words for placing Bedouin in places that the Palestinian Authority wants to control politically. So we showed this to them. They were quite shocked. Uh, and we've made some progress because they're beginning for the first time to see that their humanitarian aid is not being used for humanitarian purposes. And now, Naomi, we have a few questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. uh, we have. Okay, can see, you link this map Ari. somewhere? I think okay. Ari and then Ariella. Okay, so first of all, um, the our extensive report, our most recent report, um, I will send to you. Uh, it's called The War of Attrition, uh, a, year, a, t a Decade of the Fayad Plan, and that has some of these maps in it, not all of them. Some of them are from previous reports. I will start uh, sending stuff on the chat, hopefully as we talk, but let me see what the specific questions are. Why does Ottoman law have any power since the Ottoman Empire does not exist anymore? That is an excellent question. Um, because the state of Israel did not apply the law, Israeli law to these areas, which they were certain would cause massive international uproar. Um, and that is exactly the conversation going on in Israel now. It's one of the biggest uh, conversations going on in the Israeli government now. And one of the things that the unity government was formed uh, or hopefully will be formed in the next few days in order to accomplish. The state of Israel never extended Israeli law to these areas, which is why the only law that was left was what existed before. Now, there were two options. One option was Jordanian law, because the Jordanians had been controlling the area up to that point, but, Ill but illegally. So they, went, they jumped over, they kind of leapfrogged past the Jordanian rule and went all the way back to who was there before. And who was there before was the Ottoman Empire which of course no longer exists, you're right, it didn't exist at the time, but that was the only actual sovereign of the area beforehand. So this is a double-edged sword. We're enforcing a, a set of laws that are from, a, well, part of the law that's enforced in Judea and Samaria is from Ottoman land law, part of the law, some of the things having to do with other types of rights come from mandatory law, so they have a basis in England, uh, most of those have already been abandoned as well. Um, and very, very little of it, when you have nothing in between, comes from religious law, either uh, Muslim law or Jewish law. So it's a whole mishmash of laws. It's a, a giant mess. Um, we believe that this is a very unhealthy situation, but the Palestinian Authority has used it to their advantage um, extremely aggressively. And Israel has not protected itself or its resources um, because it is afraid of international sanction. Okay, next question was, have you ever encountered law dilemmas regarding privacy and security in which Arabs or Jewish people have been concerned? Drill license necessarily laws of research. Yes, well, all of our drones, first of all, are licensed. We had to go through a very, very rigorous system um, and there are very, very strict laws about how to use them, where to use them, where you're not allowed to use them. Israel, again, has a lot of restricted zones uh, we only went over to drones when our field workers were attacked in some of the places that they went to. So it was safer to keep a little bit of a distance. But yes, we had to be licensed. We have a, a fleet of drones that are registered 
monitored, and we use them very, very carefully within legal guidelines. So yeah, privacy and security are definitely an issue uh, on both sides. And we are very, very careful not to overstep in any of those cases. We don't go into places that are restricted uh, without permits and without being accompanied by the relevant authorities. As a matter of fact, if you look, you can look it up in the Jerusalem Post and in Haaretz. Last week, we, had a, we also have a whole project that tries to protect archeological sites in Judea and Samaria. And a team of our archeologists went out to the field in Area C, in an area under full Israeli jurisdiction, and they were arrested by Palestinian, armed Palestinian police, completely illegal. They shouldn't be there, they shouldn't be armed. They arrested them and it was a whole whatever. Um, <clears throat> but we don't go into any places uh, that require permits unless we have the permits. So yeah, we're, we're very, very careful about those privacy and security uh, issues. And we are extremely careful about the law, the whole basis of our organization is that we want equal and universal enforcement of the law and adherence to the law. So, yes. Other questions? No, okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add this file. Hold on. Uh, I'm gonna add the file, this whole presentation to, let me see where it is. Mm -mm -mm. Okay, I have just put it up. It'll take a second to load. And then I will put up as well our most recent report, the War of Attrition report. And you can, I will also give you my email and my WhatsApp. And if you have any specific questions or would like more information or to cover other topics, um, that would be great. We can also, I would say, have a look at our website have a look for a really quick overview of all the things that we're involved in. You can look at our annual report from this past year, uh, and that'll just break it down for you in terms of our different departments and subjects, some of our top uh, law cases and things that are ongoing. And God willing, we'll meet you in Israel when we bring the Club Z Israel trip, uh, whenever they allow us to. Hopefully this will we'll get a group out there. Okay, now I'm just gonna look for that report uh, on my computer in a manner that will press web. Okay, let's see if this one will load well. I'm trying to find one that's not too heavy so it doesn't make everybody's computer crash at the same time. But you should have those documents uh, on this chat soon. One of them I think is already up. The other one is taking its time. And um, yeah, so if you have any specific materials that you need, always just feel free to reach out and, and ask me. My email is really easy to remember. You can write it down. It's naomi at rigavin.org. And I see Ari has a question. Yeah. How did you get first get involved in Rigavim? <laughs> That's an interesting question. Okay, so I was a, I have worked as a freelance editor um, and ghostwriter and yeah, translator for years. And someone had recommended me to Rigovim when they needed some work translating some documents. I worked on them and then I worked on more documents and more documents and eventually they said, you know, we really actually need somebody who can speak English and understands what we do and is dedicated to the same types of issues, why don't you come and work on the inside? And I jumped at it because I had known about Rigovin for a very long time and admired their work very much. So I was, <laughs> so I've been there for about uh, going on three years. We have another question about how well known Rigovin is in Israel. So Rigovin is fairly well known. We'd like it to be much more well known, obviously. Um, I think outside of Israel, we are, the, we are Israel's best kept secret, unfortunately. We don't want to be, <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm essentially the entire international division. So anything that happens that's not in Hebrew is me. Uh, and I can only do so much, which is why I, would, I love speaking to groups of young people who communicate well with one another and communicate well um, 
digitally, electronically, however you want to call it, because we really want to get our messages out there. So if all of you have a look at our Facebook page, it's, uh, it's really, it would be amazing if you would follow, if you would share, you don't have to share everything, but we come up with different issues all the time. Something will catch your eye, something will spark your interest. You write something on there, a question or whatever, I'll be the one to respond and happily. Yes, Ari. So in these Israeli uh, settlements, when like uh, an Israeli like paves their backyard or extends mm -hmm. a patio, mm -hmm. who notices these things? Like <laughs> Peace now. Peace now does what we do. Let me tell you a quick story about how we really got started. And in, in 2005, uh, Peace Now was at the height of its activism. Peace Now was bombarding the Israeli courts with case after case after case, prosecuting illegal construction by Jewish, Jewish people living inside Jewish communities uh, that had, uh, for things like this, for adding on a room, for building another house, for whatever, very often claiming that Israelis were building on stolen land, on land that belonged to others for a whole variety. That's another topic for a whole nother day about what that's really about. Um, it has to do again with the basis of Ottoman land law and the structure of Israel's judiciary, judicial system where these things were heard by the Supreme Court rather than by an evidentiary court. The Supreme Court is a theoretical court. So you don't really have to prove ownership in order to go to court. So. In 2005, uh, there were three guys who came from very different places and didn't necessarily know one another, they didn't know one another at the time, who all somehow came to the same conclusion that if you don't exercise your sovereignty by enforcing the law, then you're not really a state. Uh, one of them was a young man who was a, a young lawyer who was incensed by the lawfare that he saw going on around him. His name is Bezalel Smotrich. He is still today um, Minister of Transportation in Israel. He might not be tomorrow when the new government is sworn in. You know, he's going to the opposition. The second person was a man named Yehuda Eliyahu, who lived in a community that was being threatened with demolition. The entire community was being threatened with demolition because 50 meters of the access road to their community um, was being uh, claimed by Peace Now belonged to someone else. 50 meters is not a lot, as you can figure out for yourselves. It's around 50 yards. Uh, and they were going to knock down an entire community and leave all these people homeless. And the third person was uh, the man who is now still the Director General of Regavim, a young man who was an officer in the IDF, who was in charge of patrolling the smuggling routes down in the Negev, used by Bedouins over the border. And what he saw around him was complete lawlessness, complete failure by the state of Israel to enforce the law in the Negev, uh, and a massive loss of resources down in the Negev. The three of them all came from different directions, but came to the same conclusion. How did they get started? They took the Supreme Court petition of Peace Now against this community called Harisha. They took a red pen and they crossed out the name of the community and they wrote instead of it, the name of an Arab uh, quote unquote community that existed in the exact same area under the exact same conditions with the exact same legal status. And they handed it into the Supreme Court and the judges were dumbstruck. They were flabbergasted. They said, you can't do this, can you? And they talked to one another and they said, well, essentially they can, no one had ever done it before. No one had ever used the law to force the state to enforce the law against illegal Arab activity, only the other side. So that was the first mirror petition that was submitted by Regavim and uh, things developed from there. 